everybody. Uh, my name is Ricky LaVon, and you are back here again with another Bible study on the book of Your God Would Be My God, a Bible study on the book of Ruth. Today, we're going to be doing lesson nine, My Name is Mara. But of course, before we get started, let us, of course, start off with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for what you have done, said, and did in our lives. Now, please definitely guide us through this particular lesson. Allow us to be able to have the information um, that we can gain from this. Show and teach each other the Lord and also be able to show that to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So we're, of course, continuing our study in the book of Ruth. And this one is on lesson nine, which is on Ruth chapter one, verses 19 through 22. But we're going to get started with question one, where it says, how did Bethlehem respond when Naomi and Ruth entered the city? And this is found in Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. If someone can find that for me and read it, please. Okay. So okay. they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? Amen. That's right. So they were excited to see them. It probably had been a while, especially for Naomi. They didn't know who Ruth was, but they were excited to see her, that she had returned. And that must have been a really good feeling for her to be able to come back and to know that you were not forgotten at all, that when you returned. So that was a good thing. Now, question two, it says, it had been years since the people in Bethlehem had seen Naomi. Unlike now, they didn't have social media, Zoom, and emails to keep them connected. And the question is, is there someone in your life whom you haven't reached out to or communicated with in a long time? And if you can do so, why not contact them and have a positive experience? Now, this particular one is more of a personal question. So we need to start listing off people that we would like to be able to <laughs> reach out to. Of course, mm -hmm. on your book, it is very good to be able to put that on there and just ask the Lord to say, you know what, Lord, I would like to be able to reach out to whomever it might be. And for anyone who might watch this video later, that would be good as well. There's nothing wrong with putting it down on paper and being able to say, okay, Lord, help me be able to reach out to them. And you can do that through, I know for myself, I need to be better at like on Facebook, some of the other social media sites and whatnot. So this one's more of a personal question that you might have listed someone, could be a family, a friend, a former coworker, someone you've seen at church or even at school. Just someone that you're like, you know, I haven't talked to him in a while. And I wrote this down. I was like, nah, I wrote a few names down. And so I need to reach out to them because since COVID and several other things, um, just kind of haven't really been reaching out to people as much. So I said, all right, well, I would like to be able to do that. So that's more of a personal thing, but just something to really think about and say, hey, let me just reach out to someone just to say hello or whatnot. So question three says in 2020, speaking of some interesting times, a pandemic necess necessitated people to stay away from each other to slow the spread of a highly communicable virus. Of course, this led to creative ways of staying in contact. Explain why it's important for people to congregate and remain in touch with one another. So why is that important for us to come together? I put to encourage one another. Because the world <laughs> experienced a tragedy in 2020, not just, just a group of people of a certain country. It was the world that experienced that. So mm -hmm. it, it, it encouraged one another when we can't get together or go anyplace. Yeah. I like that. I like that. To <laughs> encourage one another. That's true. I like that. Um, yes, sir. I put it, it helps a person, you know, not to be forgotten and for people to communicate with each other. Oh, I like that. I like that. Um, Cause we don't, I think deep down inside, I think we want to be remembered. Um, I know one way people obviously do this, but you have children that kind of puts passes on your lineage and whatnot, but there's also other ways of course, that you can also get out there to not be forgotten things that you do, um, things that you might say and whatnot, but it's also is really good to be able to come together to be helpful, encourage, like mom was saying, but also, yeah, you're right, not to be forgotten and to um, uplift one another. Esther, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I would um, 
you know, getting together helps with loneliness and boredom. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Because by yourself, you can just be like, I know a lot of people went through that in 2020. But they were just like, I'm bored, I'm lonely, or this or that. They were craving <laughs> attention. So you're right. Now, you guys all put it from a, the encouragement, not to be forgotten, loneliness. And then I put on mine, well, from a scientific species, by the way, <laughs> we're actually geared to be in a group. Um, that's how humans actually, mm -hmm. we thrive um, as a group species. We're not like spiders. Um, certain other animals that are actually more loners until they have to mate and then they separate from each other. Whereas humans, we actually do thrive and we do much better when we're in groups. So it is very important to come together so that way we can be of one accord. I mean, good grief, in the right. Bible, they came together so well that actually Jesus had, well, God had to like um, mess up their language because they were trying to build this <laughs> giant tower and it was like, I kind of told you not to do this, but um, yeah, yeah. you guys are working really well together. So you had to kind of like disperse that. But it's just one of those things of whenever we come together, we can do really, really amazing things when we're all focused mm -hmm. and have a really good plan. But I like what you guys had to say there. Now, question four says, Naomi was not happy with her situation and desired to be called by a different name. What was it? And explain her reason for the new moniker. And this is found in Ruth chapter one, Verse 20 and 21. Someone could read for that. Read that for me, please. Ruth chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Uh, I'm going to read it. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then ye call me Naomi, seeing that the Lord hath testified against me and the almighty has afflicted me. That's right. Um, Naomi was not feeling it up until this script. I didn't realize that's what Mara meant, like bitterness or whatnot. I feel sorry for, I guess anyone who might be named Mara probably didn't know that themselves. Like that's not my name, <laughs> but <laughs> it's one of those things. Yeah. But it's one of those things though. She was feeling really down and it just kind of goes, I'm so glad the Bible doesn't hide when people feel that yeah. way. Uh, sometimes I think we look back on biblical characters and we think that they're all almost, we almost deify them. Like they're all living perfect and this and that. But in reality, they were human beings. Even though she was on this trip, even though she had you know, gone through what she had gone through and she's probably going through the stages of grief, she was still feeling down. Um, and it probably hit her when she went back in town because she would have remembered being in Bethlehem with her sons and her husband. So some of those memories could have flooded back. And she was probably just like, you know, I'm just look, I'm just not feeling it. And it shows you that it's okay when people go through things, regardless of what it might be. It's okay to feel bad, to feel down, to to have those kind of emotions. I think sometimes we we act like it's not, but in actuality it is. And she was going through. Even though she had all the faith and she must have represented God in an incredible way while she was in Moab, she <laughs> still was feeling down about the situation and what happened. Does anyone have anything like to add to that as far as how Naomi was feeling? Mm, good. Okay. <laughs> now it says, question five, Naomi isn't the only character in the Bible to be upset with God. How did Jeremiah feel after being in prison? for relaying a message from the Lord to the high priest. And this is actually in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse seven and eight. Jeremiah 20, verse seven and eight. Um, actually, let me see. I could read this one and then we can kind of, just, we can discuss it. Jeremiah 20, verse seven and eight. This is from Jeremiah. He said, you deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You seize me and prevailed, and I'm a laughingstock all the time. Everyone ridicules me. For whatever I speak, I cry out. I proclaim violence and destruction because the word of the Lord has become for me constant disgrace and derision. So how did Jeremiah feel at that time for relaying a message from the Lord after being in prison? No, he felt deceived by God. Right. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Now, for context. Oh, go ahead, Mom. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, the people were making fun of him. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was doing what the Lord told him to do. But they um, threw him in prison. You know, he, it's like the Lord wasn't there for him. Correct. And we must say something, Mr. I was going to say the, the, I was going to say the same thing. Okay. And for context, in Jeremiah chapter 19, um, the Lord told Jeremiah to relay a message to the high priest that Israel was about to go through some things. That's when the Syrian army was about to come in. And they were going to exile the people. So it was going to go down. The high priest at that time was trying to tell the king that Jeremiah was lying, that nobody was going to take over. God wouldn't allow that. Jeremiah was like, yes, it will. It's going to be destroyed. So at the beginning of chapter 20, um, they snatched him up, beat him, and threw him in prison. And that's when Jeremiah said what he said, because he was like, you told me to say this, Lord. And what that got me was beating, people making fun of me, and me throwing in prison. So that's why Jeremiah felt the way that he did. However, question six says, despite how Jeremiah felt, what was his ultimate decision when proclaiming God's message? We don't have to read it. You can just say, what was his ultimate decision when proclaiming God's message in question six? Because Jeremiah had a relationship with God. He could not mm. keep God's message to himself. And he decided to let God's will be done to the people who mocked him. Amen. And I like how you put that. He had a relationship with God. Yes, he was going through something bad. Yes, he did what the Lord told him to do, and it didn't probably work out in the way that he thought it would. But I like that you said that. He had a relationship with God, and so he had to keep going, even to the people who were saying something to him. So that's an excellent way of putting it. Anybody have anything else to add to that? I, I like how, like you said earlier, um, how it the, the Bible also adds when people get upset with God when they go through something because we we experience that you know I'm going through something now personally and I feel like I feel like Jeremiah and Naomi you know yeah <laughs> you told me to do this you know but yeah but the thing is 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 like Missy said you have a relationship with the Lord so you're hanging there with Him even though you you could get upset. Um, because that's the, our human thing, but then, okay, Lord, I'm sorry, but help me through this. You know, you have me doing this. And that's what pretty much the conversation Jeremiah had with the Lord. You told me to do this. Now right. here I am in prison, you know? Yeah. So, but that, that's the for real thing. Yeah. That's true. And you're right. And you're right. Some it, it, that that's true. Where you're like, I thought you said to do this. What, what's going on for real Lord? So, and that's right. true. And 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 I, uh -huh. this is some of this type of stuff is the type of things where I think in church sometimes we gotta hear more of. I know it's not right. like the happiest of news, so it doesn't make mm -hmm. people want to give as much in church when they hear that's kind of a sermon. But I think sometimes we do need to hear that to say because some people are struggling and they might be going through something. And you need to hear there's people in the Bible who's gone through and they were down. Mm -hmm. They might feel like how you feel. So. And it's a good thing to hear and to say, but you still got to have that relationship with the Lord and you build on that. So that's true. Yeah. Question seven says, why do we suffer? This is another one we can just discuss. The Bible verses for that was James chapter one, verse two and four and Romans chapter five, verses two through five. Question was, why do we suffer? I like how James brought out is <laughs> is the faith. You know, we go through things to for our faith to be tested. And then Romans says, uh, through our faith, it gives us patience. Mm. There you go. Yeah. I like that. Esther Thomas. Yeah, I basically put the same thing. Same thing. To have faith and keep, you know, patience and keep the faith. I Amen. said, um. Tribulation grows patience. And from Romans, tribulation strengthens our bond with God. 
and girls bond. I like that with God. And you're absolutely right. Um, it is oftentimes in those hard times that we do learn something about ourselves. And we also learn how to overcome teams where they don't go through things as far as in the, um, in the regular season, especially like in basketball. And then when times get tough in the tournament, they don't know how to handle pressure. Compared to teams who've gone through pressure, they've faced better teams, they've overcome some hardships, and they've able they've won through them or learned how to win even spite of loss, something of that nature. So when they face pressure in the tournament, they can go right through it. They're mentally already know we've been there, we've done that, we can win this game. So you're right. Sometimes it is through those times, through hard trials and tribulations, that we can learn. I've overcome something of this nature before, so I know we can definitely do this again. And when you build that up, that only causes you to get stronger and closer to the Lord, relying on him to make sure that you can overcome anything that might come our way. Sorry about that. that was interesting. All right. Question eight. Oh, go ahead. You about to add to that? Go ahead. No, no, that was good. Um, But in one of these lessons, did we read about God telling somebody like, you know, because of your actions, your future generations is going to suffer. Is that before this or that after? Oh, oh boy. I was looking at the lessons. I'm like, I can't. I think that might have been when we did the one that has all the red. Oh, I was looking at yeah. Nahum, I think. I think. Oh, wait, that might have been earlier. I forgot. The first part of this lesson is on a wide variety of other topics. So that might have been earlier. I can't remember which one exactly, but that does sound familiar. Okay, so we read. And last question. But since, since people of that time, you know, families, they kept good records. So they might have known or had like what we call folk tales, but, you know, stories of, you know, God pulled us out of this, but we were mm -hmm. disobedient. So we're, some of us probably will have to suffer like they, they would have known that or maybe. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, depending upon. Yes. Some of those stories, they definitely would have known. Um, a lot of it was like sung or so. That's what those prophets, those people were talking about it. So they didn't have it like how each of us have our own copy. It was more like the prophets or the scribes or people, someone like that would have it. They would come in, they would say it, but they also taught each other to know a lot of that stuff by heart. Like how you want to turn a lot of the, the, the Bible into song. They sung a lot of it to help them remember. So that's, which I think is really interesting and their oral history on this. So they actually did know a lot. Now, whether they chose to follow it or not, that was um, <laughs> up to them. But you're right. They actually did know a lot. Okay, Can I that? Oh, Missy, to answer your question, I think that was Moab. Moab, the Lord told them not to go into the sanctuary or something like that. From one generation, the 10th generation or something. The, he was definitely, yeah, the Moabites were not supposed to go in there, right? Yeah. That's no, right. it, well, that, but no, it was something else we read where God brought them out, but said something to them like, "Hey, you're gonna have to suffer. You're you're somewhere." Generations. Yeah, like it was something like that. So if they kept these songs, when Jeremiah, that's Jeremiah we just read about. Yes. Yes, when Jeremiah said, "Hey, we're about to." go through some stuff it's it, even today we do it now they don't remember the songs that they were singing because the song said the future generation is going to come a time where you go through stuff and he tells them to go through it but instead of you know believing the song and believing as proper to god we're going to beat you up and put you in jail you're right and i can't remember exactly where that is you're right there is something where he did say different generations would have to go through and of course jeremiah speaking of him he, of course, says, because of what we've done, what you guys have done, we're about to go through. But a lot of times it's because we don't really have the 
we refuse to believe when something like that can happen. And so we're thinking like, no, it has to be good all the time. Even when the Lord says, this thing is going to happen to you, but you can overcome whatever. We're still like, no, no, that's not the Lord. That's something else. And, so, and then which is exactly what they did. They threw Jeremiah in prison and it obviously ended up being the Lord because they absolutely got in there and got dispersed and everything else. But it was just one of those, but you're right. You're right. They did know. And they, they just, I don't know if it was, they didn't want to believe or they just, and they just couldn't handle it. It's tough to be able to, when you hear news like that. So, mm -hmm. but that's a great point that you brought up though. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. So question eight says, Paul even mentioned how there was a weakness that he begged the Lord to remove. What was the reason for the issue and how did Paul apply it to his life? This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 through 10. We can just discuss um, what was the reason for the issue and how did Paul apply it to his life? Talking about the, what was going on with him. Yeah, anybody. I put both things. Uh, my Bible kept talking about boasting. So I hmm. said Paul took ownership of his weakness and gave his problems to Jesus. Knowing that God has a great reward for him. I like that. Took ownership of his weakness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is which is excellent, which is true. Mm -hmm. well, they yeah. said boasting. It's amazing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he had a lot of pride. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know what's Go ahead. What are you about to say, Mom? And then I'll say something. Go ahead. No, you can go ahead. Well, you know what's funny? I've heard other people have said some stuff about that. And the amazing thing is, I think it's because they're forgetting. And I've heard ministers and other people talk about that. And Paul did. He was he he was very learned. He he went through like the equivalent of a law school for that time. So he was very very educated paul was very educated um but i think a lot of people forget that paul also when he was on his road to damascus had that moment where the bright light hit him and he couldn't see for three days and then he had the scales that was removed from his eyes one issue that was amazing about paul is that unlike most people who were completely healed he actually he was healed and that he could see his vision was never the same after that. Mm -hmm. I can't remember which one of the things that he's written. I don't know if it's in Galatians or in Colossians where he says, you can tell that I wrote some portion of the, the part that, that he's writing. He's like, cause you could tell that I wrote it in my own hand and people read it. They're like, yeah, of course, whatever. Apparently at that time is because he, you know, if you have, if you have hard, someone who write, who can't see that well, when you see them write, their print is big. <laughs> it's not small because they can't read it. So they write in a way where there's like big font, like a big letter or so. And I guess that's when, so you could tell when Paul wrote something, but yeah, this dude wrote this. I'm sorry. I'm doing this one. Actually, he wrote in this angle. But he wrote it because he was bigger, big. So his vision was good, but was it like 100%? It was like, it was okay, but it wasn't like, so it's interesting. But he did also have, he was also a little arrogant, and he had no time for people who was not about trying to do the ministry. A uh, big reason why him and, oh, I can't remember if it was Silas, it was Barnabas who was first. Paul and I think Paul and Silas, yes. where um, John Marcus, who ended up writing the Gospel of Mark, who went with them and then went back home for a reason and then said, OK, OK, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. He was young and he tried to go back with him. And Paul was like, no, he left the first time. Forget him. Silas was like, 
no, we should take him under our wing. And Paul was like, oh, I'm not doing it. So they split. And then I think that's when you get Paul and Barnabas or so, who then continues on. And Silas <laughs> and, Tim and John Mark then did his thing. <laughs> so Paul, no one's perfect. That's the one that we can <laughs> see. No one's perfect. Who's doing this thing for the Lord? But I like how the your version talked about that. I was like, well, he was kind of boastful. He was kind of like the one yeah. person who was possessed and kept following around. He was just like, in the name of Jesus, leave. And just like took the thing out of her and just kept on going. And, you know, he was, just, that was him. So entertaining dude, really, really entertaining guy. But the great thing that you, but you, what you said and what Paul mentions is that, but he recognized I'm not perfect. So he took his weakness, regardless of what it was, boastfulness, eyesight, this, that, whatever. And he took it before the Lord. And when, when that would rear up, he would go to him and say, "Go, okay, Lord, I need you. I mm -hmm. need you here. And that shows us to do the exact same thing. And our weakness, when, you know, Lord, I have a problem with this. Whatever it is, go to God at that time. But I'm glad that that version said, and you're right. That is an excellent, excellent point. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Mm, good. Okay. Question nine says, realizing that there is suffering, how do you deal with problems when it comes into your life? You can either be personal. How can a person deal with problems when it comes into our life? Well, I, I put at first we might experience feelings of stress, anger, fright. But then we must, like Paul, give these feelings to God and allow God to take care of our needs as long as we are honest with him. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, same thing. I put, you know, it is stressful, but knowing that God is on your side, everything will be all right in the end. Mm -hmm. Amen. I agree. Yeah. I like that too. I like that. Yep. Knowing that God is going to be there, that is such a help. That is such a help. Did you have anything mm -hmm. to add to that, Mom? Well, basically the same thing, but, um, and don't let it distress or anything drive you away from God because some people it can drive them away so we have to stay in constant contact with him like Paul did he yes. stayed in contact and that's how he handled it so we have to stay in, even though we get all upset and stuff still stay in contact that keeps you base you know that, yes. that base with the Lord that's right and I put it on there just take it day by day you know just take it one day you're like okay this is what it is let me deal with this now the next day. Sometimes we like to think too far ahead. And it's it's easy to do. And it's, it's tough not to. But sometimes like, all right, Lord, let me just worry about for today. Help me to get over whatever is going on today. And then when tomorrow happens, thank you, Jesus, for that. Now help me today. So I like what you're saying. As long as we know that God is going to be there, that is big. So question 10 says, on a personal note, is there an issue that you're asking God to remove? And how can you learn like Paul to live with a thorn plague in your life? This is another one of those questions that is very personal. No need to be saying up here, well, I'm dealing with what? No. <laughs> um, and also, if anyone does this as a group study, don't have everyone mentioning out whatever the personal things are out there to the group. That is between them and the Lord. And and how each person deals with that particular thing or their coping or their ability to, to do that is between them and the Lord. But it is good in this lesson to write it down and to say, Lord, this is something that I'm dealing with. No different than Paul did. No different than Naomi kind of like said her thing. Jeremiah, we're learning about characters who was open and honest with God, whether it's something that's done to them or something internal that's for being reflected out. They're being personal with God and they're saying, this is an issue that I'm dealing with, Lord, help me. And God could then give them ideas that they can write down and go back to and say, this is the means of um, a way of being able to deal with that thorn. So that's just something there for that. So question 11 says, no one is immune to problems. And it says, look at the verses below and write out how they can encourage you and others 
while going, it says to go through hard times, but while going through hard times. The scriptures are Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31, Isaiah chapter 41, verses 9 through 10, Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. We don't have to read these, but we can just, what is at least one point that you saw, one or two points that you saw from these scriptures that we can use to be able to encourage one another when people are going through hard times? Well, I learned that if we keep going through with God, we won't tire. We won't get tired if we mm. continue to hold on to God's um, unchanging hand. Um, he'll get us through. He'll keep us. He'll give us that strength that we need um, to get through it. Amen. I like that. We won't get tired. I like that a lot. Be patient and praise him at all times. And always believe and comfort your brother through hard times. Um, that's very powerful as well, being patient and praising God. And then, like you said in the end, making sure to comfort the person. A lot of times people don't feel like they have that comfortness or that that group setting, as we were talking about at the beginning of this lesson. So that's very important to be able to come in there and do that. I like that. Don't get tired and also be patient and praise the Lord. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, for Romans 15, um, God gave us the Bible to serve as our roadmap for yes. our lives. Uh, that is true. Very true. The Bible is that roadmap. It's what we're supposed to be using to help guide us. And it's such an incredible book, but it's also a very big book. So there's so much in there. And we're blessed to be able to have the entire Bible, literally sometimes some factors on our phones. Um, so we're able to just look up. I mean, cause now we can go to Google and say how to deal with blah, blah, blah. What is blah, blah, blah scripture. And it'll be like, you talking about these scriptures? What's on faith in the Bible? And it'll just list. And now we can just go there. So now there's ways that we can really truly be able, like you said, use that Bible as our roadmap. Uh, one thing I put in here is that we should not be, just from Isaiah 41, we shouldn't be afraid um, of what's around to be able to encourage one another. Of course, I love, as mom was mentioning earlier, Isaiah 40, talking about the eagle's wings, not being weary, um, how important they are, especially when you see, I think in that area, I think they have bald eagles, but they probably also had golden eagles, um, which are really big as well. You know, how they swoop down and fly and they do all kinds of stuff. So, it's just one of those things of really encouraging one another, like stuff life might look a little tough now, but if we as a group would constantly encourage each other, think about how great um, we all could be if we did that. Right. Question 12 says, when did Na Naomi and Ruth arrive back in Bethlehem? I'm going to read this one. Ruth chapter one, verse 22. When did Naomi and Ruth arrive back in Bethlehem? And it says, so you know, Naomi came back from the land of Moab with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabitess. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the harvest. So they showed up right during harvest time for barley harvest. Um, there was other times of the year for other harvest, but I think barley was a little bit earlier than most of the, most of the other ones. It was March and April. March and April. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of an mm -hmm. interesting time for it, which means it grows during the winter. Um, most yeah. of your Harley stuff, like if you grow any fruits or vegetables, usually you can't even reap any of that to maybe July, August. Well, in moderate to cooler climates. I forgot. In hotter climates, your season is a little bit earlier <laughs> or your fruits can get even bigger. So it just kind of depends on, on where you live, basically. But thank you, though, March and April. I thought it was a little bit earlier for barley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they, I looked it up. They planted in November and December. That's amazing. Which I thought was weird. I'm like, what is the temperature over there? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that really gives you something. I need to look up more on barley for it to grow because mm -hmm. it still gets chilly. It's not like it's in a yeah. hot, hot climate. It's not uh, yeah. freezing, but it's not. Yeah. So I need to look up more on barley. On oh, why does it? Mm -hmm. Why can't it grow during such a it's cool summer. part of the year? That's interesting. Yeah. Most mm -hmm. festivals and stuff like that don't. 
but it's really, really interesting. So, but true. knowing that, question 13 says, God allowed Naomi and Ruth to arrive at a time for a country coming out of famine and new possibilities. How was God working in your life to set up opportunities for advancement and to complete his will? Now, you can say that from your own self, or you can say, what are ways that God can work in people's lives to set up opportunities for advancement? So you can either go really personal or you can go general for that one. But that's for question 13. Okay. Well, for me, personal, uh, I'm working on um, a project and it's information for me. Mm. All of this information that I found, um, had I received the money earlier, I would not be able to add this new information into this project. So, um, but it's, it's, it's reading all this book is how the Lord is guiding me to these different books and to these different um, writers for information that was happening during this time that I'm working on. So, Amen. you know. So if you, you keep holding on when you're going through something, God will start revealing certain things to you so that you can can do the work that he wants you to do. It may be slow. He says, your, my time is not your time. Mm -hmm. My way is not your way. <laughs> but, you know, if we hold on, he'll, he'll start showing himself slowly to you through little things. Yeah. It's true. I like that information. Answer in Thomas. I just feel like, you know, putting certain things in the right place at the right time and just believing that God will make a way. Amen. And I like how you said putting things at the right place at the right time. That's when you really know. It's like, wow, Lord, that worked out just right. So it really mm -hmm. lets you see how God can just set that up in a way that you're like, oh, we never even thought that this would have to happen. This would have to happen for this to happen. So that's an excellent point. Um, I just put, even though I'm going through a season of tribulation because of my disobedience to God, however, because of this season, my relationship with God is growing and I'm actually excited to serve God. Like, as you guys saw, I did that sermon net, which would have never happened. And, um, you know, eventually I'm going to start teaching type of school to the mixed group kiddos at church and, you know, you have this musical that God blessed me with to share with others. So because of tribulations, like, okay, you know, it wasn't as strenuous as Paul getting blind and stuff, but um, you guys know what the tribulation is. It's like, okay, I mean, let me go ahead and do what I need to do because I was lazy and Laodicean long enough. <laughs> you brought up something that was really interesting in that through tribulation, people, your proof that people can choose one or two things to do. Either A, you can use the tribulation as an excuse not to do something, okay? Or you can use it to fuel you to be even more active, as you were saying, doing things that was out of your comfort zone that you had never done before, which is really amazing. And then you use your example to help other people. And it's one of those things of, can you imagine if a lot of other people did that as well? To say, I might be going through, but I'm gonna do what I can with what I can and get out there and do something for the Lord in spite of, to encourage other people. Well, actually just your actions alone will encourage other people to also work or to do something for the Lord or to build that relationship with God. Cause it's easy to do it when it's, when times are easy, but it's a little bit different when times are tough. So I like that you put that out there. And for me, I just put on there about um, how God has been laying down a foundation of things some of the stuff that he wants me to be able to do in the future, um, books and stuff of that nature. Um, even while writing on one thing, some an idea will come up on something else. Uh, actually, that happened to me uh, like yesterday, a few days ago or so, while writing on the one Bible study. Um, there's a part that I took out because I realized you can actually exp I can actually expand it and make it its own book. So all those notes went. So I took time out of writing on one thing to. <laughs> Do something else like oh if i put all these notes in okay lord let me get back those one was like lord i want to get that down so i would not forget because that needs to get out there as well and it was a way i was like oh i now see how that can happen so like you were saying 
sometimes it's that foundation, that building up. And while you're going through whatever it might be, you say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to serve until either you come, well, when you come, I'm alive, or so I can't do it no more. But that would be it. Outside of that, I'm going to keep on serving, keep on doing this. Because it's just that pull, like Jeremiah was saying. Even though I might be going through, there's just a pull to keep saying something or keep doing something. So before we close out, do you guys have anything else to add to that at all? That was excellent. That was really, really good. Now we're going to go back to the normal schedule. Um, so the first Tuesday in February, which I believe is like two weeks from now, we're going to be on lesson 10. And it has coincidence with a question mark. So that is the next lesson. We're getting into Ruth chapter two. All this time we've been just in Ruth chapter one. So now we're getting to Ruth chapter two. So let's close this out with prayer. Dear Lord, we just want to say thank you so much for being here with us for guiding us, dear God, and for just allowing your spirit to bless us. Now, dear God, please continue to be with each and every one here on the call, but also all those who will be listening later. Bless us, dear Lord, and allow us to be able to have an understanding of your word, to be able to apply it to ourselves, dear God. And no matter what we might be going through, dear Lord, to never give up on you, build that relationship, and keep on pressing on to do the work that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.